Thanks everyone, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm gonna do a little bit of a reintroduction um, for our friends on the interwebs. Um, again, my name is Bobby Godby. I'm the Director of Communications for Mountaineers for Progress. Thank you for sticking around for um, our second forum of the evening. This is technically our third candidate forum that the um, West Virginia League of Women Voters and uh, Mountaineers for Progress have partnered together to host. So thank you for participating. Thank you for eating snacks. Um, we're going to get started here in just a minute, but I want to make sure everyone's aligned on our format. So we'll start with opening statements. Those will be two minutes. We'll then go into a series of preset questions, which will be 90 seconds per candidate. Then we'll open it up to audience questions. We do already have a pretty healthy stack of those, but as you think of them, please feel free to grab an index card and a pen, jot that down, um, hand it over to one of our folks over here in the corner. Um, just keep in mind those questions will be asked to all of the candidates, so we want to make sure that those are um, worded in a way that will allow us to do that quickly. We're also going to take questions from our live stream, so that will be happening as well. Um, something to note, you'll notice that we don't have everyone here today who is on, um, who will be on the ballot, um, and that is due to another candidate form that there's a conflict with. As you all know, um, this region and this uh, county, or er, area is quite large and we do have a number of candidates who are kind of toggling a, a, across districts. So just a note there, um, I, we do recommend everyone to spend a little bit of time on candidates' uh, web pages, their social media platforms, uh, to learn as much as you can before you um, grab your ballot, probably your early ballot, here on the 24th. Okay? So we'll get started here with just a minute. We'll get started with our opening statements. We're going to do it at random and I'll make sure I call you guys out as we go here. Um, so again, two-minute opening statements, and um, Mr. Denny Longwell, do you mind getting us started? Oh, and quickly, I'm sorry. Miss Barbara Brown here, she's got her timer. When she gives you that yellow sign, that means you got 30 seconds. Well, Well, first of all, I want to thank you all for inviting me here and thank the League of Women Voters and the Mountaineers for Progress for putting this on. I am Denny Longwell. I'm a candidate for the State Senate in the second senatorial district, which includes Calhoun County, uh, Doddridge County, part of Gilmer, part of Marion, part of Marshall, part of Monongalia, all of Ritchie, all of Tyler, and all of Wetzel. It's not funny when you're running around trying to campaign. Um, I am a veteran of the United States Navy, was a hospital corpsman during the Vietnam War, Vietnam era. Uh, some people don't think it was a war, but um, I didn't go to Vietnam, but I served, and I'm proud of it. I'm a blue collar guy. I um, worked uh, 14 years as an iron worker on construction. Work was getting down uh, to where there was not much, and I got a job in an aluminum plant. I got very involved in the union, and from there I became an international rep for the Steelworkers Union, negotiating contracts, representing people in grievance and arbitration cases, and lobbying legislatures in Ohio and West Virginia, and some in Washington, D.C. People ask me why I'm running. From where I'm living, people are saying they don't have a voice in Charleston. And I can understand that because all I see is gridlock from D.C. and Charleston and everywhere else. So I'm running for the people. I'm not running against anybody. I am a Democrat. I'm running for the people. I'd appreciate your vote on November 6th. Thank you. Mr. Oliverio. I, too, want to thank the League of Women Voters and Mountaineers for Progress for inviting me to participate with you tonight. I'll do my best to answer your questions, and I hope to learn a little bit tonight as well. Just a little bit about my background. I'm a 30-year business owner here in Morgantown, lived in this county for over 50 years, been married for over 20 years, and have a few children running around Montague County that are WVU and Morgantown High School. I've served in the United States Army as a reserve officer and been proud to serve this community in many different ways, including service in the House of Delegates and in the West Virginia State Senate. My priorities, if given an opportunity to return to the State Senate, will be to focus on diversifying our economy. We've had a fossil fuel-based economy for a long time. In some ways, it's served us well. In other ways, it's presented problems for us. We need to diversify our economy, create the jobs of the future, and help our state move forward. I want to fight the opioid crisis. 
I want to provide more support to our frontline folks that are fighting that battle, to our first responders, to our law enforcement, to our mental health professionals, to our health care professionals, be involved in developing a holistic solution to solving this opioid crisis. And I want to improve services in Montague County and Marion County. I think we've gone a step backwards over time, and I want to address some vital services to our state uh, that I think we're going the wrong direction. I want to improve public education, including higher education, technical training, so that we can develop the personnel that we need for the jobs in the future. So thank you all for coming out tonight. I know there are a lot of other things you could be doing and a lot of other places you could be. I appreciate you taking time to give uh, each of us an opportunity to speak with you tonight. Yeah, you got it. Thank you. Well, good evening. And I'm probably blowing your ears out, I bet. I apologize for that. I'm a loud talker and I'm a fast talker. I should have been an auctioneer, probably. But thank you for being here this evening. Uh, thank you for the invitation to participate, both to the League of Women Voters and Mountaineers for Progress. What you need to know is that I'm your public servant, and I hear see a lady holding her ears back here, and I apologize, so I'll tone it down. I'm a public servant first. I'm your state senator second. And I think that's important to you, and it's important to me, and it's important to my family, that I'm there when you have a question, that my door's open in Charleston when you have a question, that you can access me on social media at any given time. You can join me on Saturday evenings, and we can discuss anything you want that's what being a public servant is all about. And that's what I will continue to do as we move forward into the next session. I'm not about the title. Again, I am the public servant. And I think tonight you have a unique, experience, unique opportunity to listen to the candidates here before you and determine who's best for the job for the 13th district and for Mr. Denny's second district. Let's start off with a few points that can't be reputed. Number one, I am the only Democrat on the ballot. I am only the de only Democrat on the ballot in the 13th district. I'm also the only candidate to be endorsed by all teachers groups, service personnel, teachers, and 30 other organizations across the state of West Virginia. I'm also the only candidate that has public stated, publicly stated his ideas for fixing PEIA. I don't mask that. We're talking natural gas severance taxes, folks. I'm also the only candidate who has stood with teachers in the rain and the snow and taken their message back inside to the chamber and shared that with other legislators. I'm also the only candidate who publicly opposes drilling in our state forests and our state parks. And finally, I don't find a need to switch parties in order to be bipartisan in any of my legislative efforts. For example, Mr. Beach, I'm sorry, we're at time. Is that two years? That's yeah, a good place to cut me off then. Thank you. <laughs> you had me until, for example, we'll get there. Um, awesome. So we'll start with our first set of uh, preset questions. They are back here. I'll read them and I'm happy to read them again because they are detailed. Um, in recent legislative sessions, West Virginia became a right to work state. Supporters of this legislation say that these laws create jobs and lower the unemployment rate. Opponents of this legislation say that it weakens labor unions, lower wages, and harms collective bargaining. If elected, elected, what position would you take on this issue and why? And we're going to start with Mr. Oliverio. If elected, the position I would take on the right to work is to leave the law as it is and give it an opportunity to see if it works. There was a momentum in the West Virginia legislature to try something different. We have not been a right to work state since the state has been in existence. And this was a, a time when there were legislators who felt like it could make a difference. And I think we give that an opportunity. If in time we find out that it is uh, harming workers, it's uh, not improving our economy and it's not working, then we have to reevaluate it. But. Uh, there was enough impetus in the legislature to make that change, and I think that change ought to be given an opportunity. I wasn't there. I didn't vote for it, um, but the decision was made, and I think we need to give that an opportunity and see if it'll work. Thank you. Mr. Beach. Yep. 
Yeah, sorry, Mr. Beach, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, well, I was there, and I adamantly opposed that piece of legislation. I spoke against it on the floor. Um, I've looked around at other states, as most legislators did during that time frame. We saw where right to work was failing in many states, and has actually created a lot of headaches for folks in other states. So it's just not what's going to happen here in West Virginia or what may happen in a few years. There's examples out there of what has occurred already which sets the stage why we should not have right-to-work legislation in West Virginia. If given the opportunity, I would take, take every chance I have to make sure we repeal that in the legislature as soon as possible. Mr. Now, this might shock you, being a, a blue-collar guy myself, but... Uh, First thing I would do would be to repeal right to work. It's um, right to work for less. It's wrong. It. Uh, I've been fighting it my whole working career for I don't know 34 years, 30 years, 40 years, something like that. Um, the first person I can remember introducing it was a gentleman from Texas named Richard Army. Uh, that was on a national basis. I just think it's wrong from what I've seen over the years. Of, uh, it, it's, it really, I believe, is an effort to uh, break the unions. And without the unions, this country wouldn't be what it is. Unions have provided a standard of living for people that aren't in the union, um, as well as a standard of living for the people in the union. So to get to the answer of the question, I would first thing I'd do is vote to repeal right to work. Thank you. Thank you. To our second question. The West Virginia Human Rights Commission has no authority over discrimination cases in housing, employment, and or public accommodations based on gender, gender identity or sexual orientation. Simply put, in West Virginia, it is possible to be fired or evicted due to your sexual identity or gender orientation. If elected, would you work to amend state code to cover discrimination based on gender identity and or sexual orientation? And we'll start with Mr. Beach. Thank you. Short answer is I would I would sponsor that piece of legislation to to make that happen to amend it. Uh, we have many states or many cities across the state who have this in their code and they're addressing the issue. We have just down the road from us in Fairmont, it's on the ballot uh, to take up this exact issue. And uh, folks, you know, we're all in this we're all in this together, and we can't be carving out people. You're going to sit over here, and you're going to sit over here, because you know what that leads to. And equality is equality is equality. And we can't, I can't stress that enough. And as your legislator, you know, if, if, the, if the, the state has the opportunity to address it, or if there's something we can help cities or munis other municipalities and counties to address the issue, I'm there for you. Thank you. Mr. Longwell. My three biggest issues are education, jobs, and uh, health care. To answer the question on this, um, I'll be the first to tell you I don't attend church services anymore, but I was brought up in a home that uh, was very religious, and I was taught that we're all created equal. And I've heard people argue the, uh, the uh, gender issue, but... Um, I, I am, uh, like Senator Beach says, I, I'm of the notion that we're all created equal. Um, I think that we need to focus on more serious things than worrying about this. Um, I don't care what somebody thinks they are. Uh, I'm, I'm Denny Longwell. I'm a citizen. I'm a blue-collar guy, and I want this country and this state to be the best it can be. I want our children to have the best education they can have. We have quality teachers, in my view. We need to support them so that our kids get that education they need. Um, so I would, uh, I'm, not, I'm not overly concerned with this issue, but I think everybody deserves the same fair chance. Thank you. Well, as with many things that I'll talk about tonight, I have a track record having served in the legislature for a long time. And I think if you'll look at my record, you'll see that I have been a champion for fairness whether it's people with disabilities, whether it's race, religion, ethnicity, 
whether it's sexual orientation, I think you will see my record has been very clear where I've stood on those issues. As many as 16 years ago, I was one of a handful of state senators voting to provide hate crime protection based on sexual orientation, provide protections based on housing and employment. So with me, you have somebody who's committed to fairness, a proven track record of that in place based on votes that occurred many years ago. Thank you. This November, West Virginia voters will be voting for or against a measure to amend the state constitution to say the following, quote, nothing in this constitution, constitution secures or protects the right to abortion or requires the funding of abortion, end quote. What is your position on Amendment 1, and what are your proposed solutions for lowering the number of unwanted or unintended pregnancies in West Virginia? And we're going to start with Mr. Longwell. Well, first of all, I don't know anybody that's really for abortion. But let me say this. I've been married twice. My first wife had to have an abortion. Difficult decision, but we had to make it. The doctor said she would die and the baby would die. So I suggest to you that Amendment 1 goes too far. When it takes away a woman's right that her doctor says she needs an abortion, I can't, I can't agree with that. My first wife uh, didn't um, take my word when I said, we have a daughter that needs a mother, and this doctor says you're going to die, and that baby's going to die. Let's have that abortion. My word wasn't good enough. She went to the, the church where we were attending services and talked to everybody there, and she finally made the decision to have the abortion, and I think she still struggles with it today. I don't. But... Just, just to say that I'm for abortion, I'm not for that at all. I'm not for it in any, any, uh, any realm except where there's rape, incest, and, and those kind of things, or the death of the health of the mother. Thank you. Mr. Oliveria. I will vote in support of Amendment 1 and given an opportunity. And part of the reason why I will do that is this is really a separation of powers issue that is confronting the state. The legislature in approximately 1993 uh, voted to limit the types of abortions that the state would pay for for indigent women. And the Supreme Court, it took about two years, uh, rendered a decision that no, the state will pay for all abortions for those deemed indigent. And really that was a decision by the Supreme Court to make a funding decision. And I believe for the three branches of government to remain co-equal, the legislature must maintain the power of the purse. The legislature must make those funding decisions. And that's why I also am supportive of the Second Amendment, which does allow the legislature to make the judicial funding. If this amendment is adopted, the law that was previously in place before the court struck it down will allow for state funding to be used for abortions that are medical emergencies, reported rape, incest, fetal anomaly cases, and those that threaten the life of a mother. So what this is doing is giving the legislature the decision. This is not ending state funding. It's giving the legislature the decision to decide what Medicaid programs they want to fund. If our Supreme Court were to go into session next week and decide they wanted the legislature to fund adult dental care for everybody that was indigent, I would feel the same way that that is a decision that should be vested in the legislature where the power of the purse belongs that ensures the branches of government remain co-equal. Sir, we're at time. Thank you. Mr. Beach. Thank you. I uh, stand up because I want to point to just the little bit of wording that's there. Nothing in this Constitution secures or protects the right to an abortion or requires the funding of abortion. Folks, I oppose that. Right up front, I'm going to tell you that right now, and I'll tell you why. Because there's no exceptions in there. And what happened on the Senate floor, we tried to get those three exceptions added to this language in case of rape, incest, or the health of the mother. And the Republicans shot it down. And it's plain and simple. It is in code. Well, as we heard, it is in code. But if this passed, this is what applies. 
This is what this supersedes what's in code. The Constitution supersedes it. I oppose it. Thank you. Thank you. According to a poll by the Pew Research Center for the People and the Press, people have become more polarized in their political views. In an increasingly polarized political sphere, how would you work to foster bipartisanship in collaboration with your opposing party members? And we're going to start with Mr. Oliverio. Well, I hope to have a good working relationship with members of the Senate from both parties based on my past. I also have participated in a process in the past where members of the Senate actually had lunch together almost every day. And I really think that helped break down a lot of the barriers. It was a process where members of the Senate contributed money to a fund and folks ran out and brought lunch in and the members took a little bit of time during the course of very busy legislative days and the senators ate together. And I think there's something powerful about breaking bread together. I think it breaks down walls and breaks down barriers and allows people to work out conflicts. And I felt like that was a very effective tool to enable us to work together and to communicate. I hope to be involved in that process again. And just in generally, I've told you before, I'm a person that's committed to fairness. I will treat all of my colleagues with a great deal of respect, as I have in the past. I think you see if things that you've read about other legislators, what they've had to say about me, it's been positive. And I'll just make every effort to try to work with people listen to their views and try to understand what has brought them to the point of the position they've taken. Thank you, Mr. Beach. <laughs> I'm pretty sure those signs are nonpartisan as well. I'll just sit on the floor. How's that? Uh, well, real quick, uh, we still eat lunch together, each and every one of us. And we still put in our $60 each month to have meals uh, brought to the chamber or we, we send a, a colleague out to, to gather up food and bring it back in. You know, I, I want to point out something. You know, I know the, the media kind of paints a picture of, of partisanship going on in the Senate, but the, the reality is, of all those bills you see, you only see a fraction that actually come through the media. 90% of the pieces of legislation were all over the page. Uh, you know, we're, 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 you know, really hand in hand on, on these pieces of legislation. It's that 10%, that friction part that you actually see in the media. And it's unfortunate, but the truth is that does occur. But now, where does Bob Beach fit into that? Well, where Bob Beach fits into that is on my, for example, in my earlier statement, is, you know, in my past year, both in the majority and the minority in the Senate, we've passed the Oversight Commission on Transportation, the DMV fees, the TIF project, which was mine, which brought us the ballpark, uh, we've added six women to the PEIA task force, and we've worked with other states to a piece a res resolution I passed, bipartisan, to work with states to open up infrastructure, infrastate, intrastate commerce in regards to hemp. These were all bipartisan votes, but there were and there were pieces of legislation that, yeah, to some degree, I had to work both sides of the aisle to try to get the votes. But yeah, there's an opportunity there to work across the aisle. And I have done that, and I have a record to prove it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Longwell. Thank you very much. Uh, there's an old saying in the union uh, world, the union community, that union sisters and brothers don't have to see eye to eye so long as they walk arm in arm. And for goodness sakes, ladies and gentlemen, we're all West Virginians. I think that we all, I, I know, we all want what's best for West Virginia. And there is partisanship. Um, I'm not in the Senate. Senator Beach can address that. But it, it appears a lot of things go, the vote goes party line. I will work with anybody, but you better work with me in return. Because if you don't, then I'm going to be your worst enemy. I want to work with the people in the Senate when I'm there. I want what's best for West Virginia. I said earlier, and I'll say again, education is my number one issue. I want our children to have the best future and best education they can have. Essentially, my life's over. I'm 71 years old. I don't, I don't feel like it, but uh, I, you know, I mean, the truth's the truth. 
and I, I want the best for the kids. And I've got grandchildren that uh, I want them to have the best, and I want that for every child. Thank you. Many citizens express concern about the increasing influence that corporations and out-of-state interests have in West Virginia elections. This is a two-part question. Do you feel it is ethical to accept donations from out-of-state corporations? If yes, how do you balance the interest of the individual versus corporations? And we're going to start with Mr. Beach. Watch me tear that off. <laughs> That's a tough question because I think every legislator I've ever known in the last 18 years has accepted contributions from out of state, whether it be Walmart or a pharmaceutical or gas companies or coal companies or you know, even teachers organizations. There's money that comes into the state of West Virginia from national teachers organizations. So it's, that's a difficult question. I think a lot of it goes back to policing yourself as a legislator or as a candidate for office. There, there is money that I don't accept. I have never accepted one dollar of tobacco money in my entire time. There's money that will never come to me, like natural gas, because they know my position on property rights and increasing the severance tax. So I think it really comes down to policing yourself. And again, there's probably other organizations that I don't accept money from, but tobacco tax is what rings a bell. Uh, yeah, I bet that's it, thank you. Mr. Longwell. Frankly, I'm tired of money buying elections. Um, I've received money from uh, union groups and some other groups, uh, West Virginia Nurses Association, but nothing from corporations. I, I think West Virginia should, uh, the people should be elected by West Virginians, not by outside money. Um, I will tell you with pride that um, I think Bernie Sanders had the right idea that we have to get this campaign finance under control. So uh, I'm against outside money coming in from corporations. You guys got it, Mr. Oliveri. If I could, if I could clarify the presentation of the question a bit, please understand that candidates running for office like us are not allowed to accept corporate contributions. We cannot accept, under West Virginia law, contributions from corporations. However. There are corporations who have employees that contribute to political action committees, and then those contributions can be made to campaigns. So nobody up here is accepting corporate contributions. But I've, in the past, have accepted contributions from individuals and individuals who have joined a political action committee based on a special interest that they may have or based on a place where they are employed uh, as a way of, of uh, funding our campaigns. So I just want to be clear that we are not accepting corporate contributions. There's no company that's writing a check to our campaign. There are companies where people work there who, just like union members, may contribute to a union pack. The employees that work at a company that are not on the union side, they contribute money to an employment and employee pack that contributes to campaigns. Thank you. As a result of the teachers' work stoppage this year, Governor Justice assembled a task force to address the need for long-term solutions to the Public Employees Insurance Agency, also known as PEIA. What long-term sustainable solutions would you propose to help fully and permanently fund PEIA? We're going to start. Um, with Mr. Longwell. I was doing so well there for a minute. Well, I've said uh, throughout the primary and throughout this general campaign that I am a uh, proponent, a supporter of uh, increasing the severance tax um, on the minerals that come out from under our feet in West Virginia. In addition to that, I think we should impose a tax on any of those minerals that leave the state. That's what Texas does. And some of the opponents that I've talked with, uh, some of my opponents say, well, they'll, they'll leave and we won't have that revenue anymore. I don't believe that for a minute. We've got, uh, they tell me uh, that there's more minerals here than anywhere else in this country. So they're making big profits off of it. I think it's time we got our fair share. The other thing that I think we should use to uh, 
fund PEIA is uh, the taxation of medical marijuana. I think that uh, needs to be done. And um, other than that, I, I haven't given that much thought any further than that. Those three things I think should be uh, looked at to fund PEIA. Thank you, Mr. Oliverio. Thank you. The uh, PEIA task force is underway and meeting. They've had a little bit of a delay. I think uh, the impeachment and some of the other things maybe have slowed down some of their action, but I'm hopeful that they will be back to work soon. I'm anxious to see what kinds of recommendations they develop. I was pleased to see Governor Justice's decision to devote uh, a significant percentage of the surplus uh, to help shore up PEIA. I think that gives us time to evaluate a long-term solution. So with the governor's decision to devote that $100 million, uh, that creates opportunities. And I think we can use general tax revenue dollars. I'm not terribly excited about developing a strategy where we use severance taxes for something like PEIA. Um, Dale Lee, who heads the WBEA and others, have expressed concern about devoting an unpredictable source of revenue to something that is such a predictable liability. So I don't know that that's necessarily the solution. Um, I think we need uh, more than anything else. We don't need more taxes. We need more taxpayers in West Virginia. And if we can get more taxpayers, more people working, we can address this and other issues. Thank you. Mr. Beach. Thank you. Well, just to let you know, I've signed my PEIA pledge that I'm committed to working to get this fixed. Uh, a couple things. Uh, I've already stated that I am in favor of increasing the severance tax on natural gas and have it dedicated to PEIA. And uh, the number could be 1%, one number could be 1.5%, depending on what, what you're looking at. Uh, to make this all work for us. Um, it's an opportunity for us uh, to have a funding measure that we can just take this monkey off our back and move forward with other things that we need to address here in West Virginia. Um, oddly enough, today, speaking of the PEIA task force, oddly enough, today, the governor's recommendation did not include the $100 million that he promised just a week and a half ago. It's the same number that he's working with that we've worked with last year which is, I think, 500 and some million dollars. So he's already reneged on that promise to teachers and service personnel and, and public employees across the state. And that being said, I'll stop. Thank you. Okay, um, we're calling an audible and we're gonna switch from our preset questions. We're gonna go ahead to the slide there that says audience questions, in case you don't know, you're the audience and these are your questions. Um, we're going to go ahead and start and try to get through as many of these as possible. Thank you for everyone who submitted them. Um, and we may also have some from the live stream. So thank you for bearing with us. Our first audience question um, is, where do you stand on charter schools? And this will start with Mr. Oliverio. Learned a little bit about charter schools over the years. And I've seen some places where charter schools have been successful. My sense is that in a rural state like ours, where we don't have significant concentrations of children, that charter schools would probably not work here, that it would drain dollars from the public school system. Uh, in very large cities, I think, where you have schools that are failing miserably, uh, charter schools become an alternative, something that needs to be looked at and needs to be considered. I happen to believe in our public schools in West Virginia. I want to be supportive of them. I want to be supportive of our faculty and staff, and I want to help them be successful. And I have a record as a member of the Senate Education Committee for 16 years of doing that. And if we didn't have a yellow card up, I'd be happy to delineate some of those things that I've done. Um, but. Uh, uh, I don't think that's necessarily a direction we need to go. I want to support our public schools and help them to be the very best that they can be. Thank you, Mr. Beach. <laughs> Those are lost causes. Yeah, I think you're right. 
Um, I too am, am opposed to charter schools, and I'll lay it out there. I'm also opposed to vouchers. Public schools and public teachers mean everything to me, mean everything to my family. I think without that little nesting environment that we have within our public school system with our teachers, uh, we're doing our, our students an injustice. And by bringing in charter schools, allowing those to promulgate around the state in different regions, it just takes away from our public school system. There are many states across the United States who have tried this, and it's been a failed experiment. Ohio is the closest state to us that just recently there was a whole charter program there, which, let's, let's face it, it's a business, and they have gone under. And that's, that's not just one example. We could probably go in and find six or seven in Pennsylvania, several in New York, possibly even some in D.C. So it's not something that I support. I love my public schools and I love my public teachers. I'm opposed to charter schools. I'm reading, uh, in the process of reading uh, Senator John Kerry's book right now, Every Day is Extra, and he talked about his childhood of being sent away to private schools. In West Virginia, I've said before, and the, my, the, the two colleagues set the, each side of me have said we talk about equality. I want every kid to have the same opportunity, the same education in West Virginia. I don't think that charter schools provides that. I want our public schools to be the best they can be, the best teachers there, the best curriculum, and, and the best facilities. I'm against charter schools. Thank you. Next question. As an increasing number of West Virginia voters are switching to independent voter status, can each of you share why you are you chose your party affiliation? And we'll start with Mr. Beach. Thank you. I actually come from a long family of Republicans. And uh, I'm not the first Democrat. My father was a Democrat. And slowly my brothers and sisters moved in that direction as, as most of the family have done. Uh, I believe that the Democratic Party re represents best what, what I see in West Virginia, and it's, it's, it's people. People are everything, and I think the Democrats have done an excellent job in serving the people. Yeah, do we hit hurdles? Do we hit a little roadblock once in a while? Absolutely. But I still think at the end of the day, it's the Democrats that will ultimately move us forward just because we listen, just because we care, just because we want to do more for you. We're not trying to choose sides, but we all know that it's the working class, that middle segment that is actually the foundation for the entire state of West Virginia. If we can secure them, make them comfortable, the rest of the state will grow. Thank you. Mr. Longwell. Me? Yes, sir. Well, like Senator Beach, uh, my family's a mixture of Republicans and Democrats. When I started working construction after I came back from the Navy, an older gentleman I was working with said to me, as long as you carry that dinner bucket and wear a pair of work boots, you need to vote for Democrats. I did not take his word for that. I watched over the years as a, a blue-collar worker, and uh, generally speaking, the Democrats supported the working man's issues. Now it's the working person's issues, but uh, and the Republicans did not. Having said that, and to be fair and honest, um, the, the unions have endorsed and supported Republicans when they support our issues. I'm a Democrat because I'm a blue-collar guy, and the Democrats have supported my life more than the Republicans have. Thank you. I'm a member of the Republican Party because I'm conservative. I believe in capitalism. I believe in free markets. I'm pro-life. I support the Second Amendment. And I had previously been a member of the Democratic Party. And to be honest, I didn't feel welcome there anymore because there weren't people like me who shared those tenets and those principles that I just outlined. And that's why I felt like the Democratic Party left me. And the Republican Party has welcomed me. I appreciate the support that I've received there. But at the end of the day, I am the same person that represented you in this community for 16 years. And you have in me a person who is committed to public service, a person who brings years of business experience military service, community service, who will be a leader for this community and who will work across the aisle with all of the citizens to help move our community forward. Thank you. Wages for the Department of Transportation workers are $10 an hour less than comparable jobs in the private sector. 
How can we raise the wages of these public sector jobs to, just, to attract the best and provide a livable wage? And we're going to start with Mr. Longwell. First of all, I'm a supporter and proponent of uh, a $15 minimum wage. Um, I just think that everybody deserves a fair living. I'm, I'm, uh, and I think that education comes back to that. I think education touches every issue that we're talking about here tonight. When we have better schools and better education opportunities, businesses will come here and, and more people will have jobs. And like Mr. Oliverio said, more taxes will be paid into the state. So uh, I, I think that uh, education is the route to the answer that question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Oliverio. Really well. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I'll certainly repeat that. Wages for the Department of Transportation workers are $10 an hour less than comparable jobs in the private sector. How can we raise the wages of these public sector jobs to attract the best and provide a livable wage? I think, like we talked about earlier, of trying to grow the number of people employed in West Virginia. We, we are 50th in the country in terms of the percentage of adults who are employed and working. We're 50th. And we have to make progress in that area to be able to deliver the valuable services that our, that our citizens need and deserve. I also think our state needs to be more entrepreneurial. And one of the things I've talked about is our state making an effort to make money itself. I've used the example of the Pittsburgh Airport Authority that sold leases around the airport for the development of natural gas. They collected millions of dollars. The royalties that they expect to collect from that could reach a billion dollars. That's the natural gas line underneath the Pittsburgh airport. I think as a community, we could come together and identify places where it made sense for us to do that type of activity. I have given an example during this campaign of a place like Camp Dawson, where I thought we could develop the natural gas beneath that site it's obviously a site that is very secured with our National Guard there, and uh, I think we need to do those kinds of things so that the state isn't worrying about collecting how much severance tax off of gas, but that the state can collect the lease payment and all the royalties into the future. Sir. And by doing that, we'll have Mr. the dollars Oliver, we at, need. We're at time, thank you. Sorry. It's my least favorite part. <laughs> Well, again, to repeat the question, really, we, we are in a situation where the Department of Highways is adequately underfunded when it comes to employees, and, and something needs to be done. And it is natural gas. Natural gas is the answer. You know, nationwide, the average severance tax is 8%. We're five. We have a long ways to go. There's, there's a margin there we can work with. And you have to keep in mind, just because we start out at eight, doesn't mean we can't come back and lower it. We've done that time and time again with the coal industry. It bounces around all the time. So we can, we can absolutely adjust as things, as growth continues here in the state of West Virginia. We also have to be focused on education. We cannot be continuing to cut, as the Republicans did two years ago, 15% from higher ed in our four-year institutions, 9% from our two-year institutions, and the cut from public ed. It's unacceptable. If we don't have education first, we have nothing. You get the education there, you create a reputation in the world that we have students and we have a workforce that we can, that we can work with. Thank you. Thank you. This is related, but it's a popular question um, from our live stream and the interwebs. So we'll explore it a little bit deeper. Um, can you share your position on bringing renewable energy jobs to West Virginia? And we'll start with uh, Mr. Oliverio. I voted for legislation as a member of the Senate to diversify the fuel sources for our power plants because I saw the challenges that we faced with coal and wanted to try to diversify our energy sources. So I'm on record with that. There are some folks that oppose that legislation, but I felt it was important that we take an all of the above approach to meeting our state's energy needs I think we can continue to derive a great deal of our electricity from coal and natural gas, but I think it's only smart to explore the other opportunities and try to develop jobs within those 
Uh, some of those don't offer the kinds of employment opportunities that coal and natural gas offer, but I think taking an all of the above approach is the right direction for us to take in terms of meeting our energy needs now and for many years to come. Thank you. Mr. Beach. Well, actually, to steal a line, I believe it's everyone is welcome here. I believe we can do marvelous things with all those entities, whether it be wind energy, solar energy, you know, hydroelectric, whatever it may be. But we have to, we have to open the doors for them. We have to make sure that they have the ability to come here and get, get off the ground in a, a way that's going to give them some security for five years until they start reaping some benefits on their end. Uh, but we can't just, just shut everything down and say, no, it's not going to work because we're in competition with coal or we're in competition with natural gas. But there's, there's enough for everyone. And I think it would be nice to get to a point where we as residents could pick and choose what we want in our homes, how we want to get our source of energy, how we want to get our heating source. So I think we just need to open up the doors, craft pieces of legislation, maybe even gives tax credits. They don't hurt. If you're not getting it now, a tax credit's not going to hurt later on because you don't have it now. So let's, let's move forward. Let's, let's, let's take and put everything on the table. Everything on the table. I've said in the past that I've done some research talking about coal, and coal's been going downhill for 35 years, maybe 40, for various reasons. Some people will have you believe coal's coming back. Bob Murray's one of them. Um, I don't believe it's coming back, people. And when, when I say that, I couple that with, a, with my thought that we have to protect the coal miners. We can't just throw them to the side of the road like we do other things. We have to give them an opportunity to retrain. And there's already um, wind turbines here. There's already solar panels here in this state. Let's expand on it, but let's protect the coal miners. Let's protect the other people in the other industries that have lost their jobs. Ravenswood Aluminum is one that comes to mind. Feldman uh, Magnesium comes to mind. A lot of people that were in the industrial world lost their jobs. Let's, let's diversify. Let's make West Virginia as great as we can make it. Thank you. This will be our last audience question before we move into closing statements for the night. What is your position on allowing gas drilling in state parks and forests? And we'll start with Mr. Beach. Well, I am on record as opposing that. Uh, folks, those drilling rigs are on ridges. And if we use Cooper's Rocks as an example, drilling, rock, drilling rigs are not in the valley where we can hide them. They're up here for everybody to see, both us as residents and both as tourists who's come through here. Who wants to drive into Cooper's Rocks knowing that there's a swath of land that's been cut out, including the trees, where it takes you back to a 60-acre pad where there's a, a, an 80-foot tall drilling rig? I don't know too many people who want to enjoy that kind of vista in the state of West Virginia. That's our lands. There's plenty of natural gas to go around under our feet. They can drill somewhere else. This is our property. It's something each and every one of you want to continue to enjoy, it, as do your children. Thank you. Mr. Longwell. I'm opposed to drilling in uh, state parks. I am too. <laughs> All right. That's right. Okay, well, um, in the spirit of time, we're going to move to our closing statement. So each of you will have two minutes apiece. Um, and we're going to start with Mr. Oliverio. Thank you. And again, I want to thank each of you for coming out tonight. As I said, my priorities are to diversify our economy. West Virginia has some real problems with our demographics. We as a state are growing older. We have more people dying than being born, the only state in the country. We're the only state in the country the last 50 years that has not grown in population. We have to do the kinds of things from a policy standpoint to attract folks to come into West Virginia, attract them to come and visit and play, to grow our tourism industry, but we also have to get them to come in and come to work and help us develop more taxpayers, not more taxes for each of us. We have to fight this opioid crisis. It has the potential for us to lose an entire generation if we don't solve this problem. We have to fight that aggressively. 
and we have to improve the quality of the state services that we're delivering. I think in the last eight years since I left the Senate, our Division of Highways numbers dropped from 55 people to 17. Our state police in this county dropped from 24 to below 10. Our Division of Motor Vehicles staff are down. We need to deliver the valuable services to our citizens, and I'm committed to trying to restore those services and continue to provide the best possible services we can provide to the people in Montegalia and Marion County. Thank you. Mr. Beach. Well, thank you. I will stand up to do closing remarks. Uh, I want you to know one thing. I hope tonight you went away with an idea of who you think is best for the job. Uh, I also want you to go away with the idea of knowing that I'm your neighbor. I'm Bob. I'm not Senator. My mom and dad didn't name me Senator. So if you see me on the street, please refer to me as Bob. Uh, and I would enjoy having a conversation with you. I want to talk about jobs. Across the river, ballpark. Mr. Bloom brought it up. Where's he at back there? You know, thousands of jobs there. And that was a piece of legislation I sponsored, bipartisan piece of legislation, co-sponsored with my good friend, Senator Prezioso. It's something that we can, it's tangible. It's something we can put our hands on. We know it's creating jobs. There's another issue that I'm working on. I briefly touched on it's hemp. Billion dollar industry, industrial hemp. And right now we sit as West Virginians on the cusp of creating some true market jobs that are going to pay well in the, in, the, in the order of textiles, in the order of hemp plastics, uh, feeds, grains, oils, hemp concrete. The sky's the limit what you can do with hemp. But we need that. We need that base to be allowed to move product across state lines. Now, the farm bill has died, and Senator McConnell was trying to legalize it. Don't know what's going to happen with the farm bill. We probably won't know anything until spring. Hopefully that legislation will be in there, and then we don't have to worry about movement. But right now, that's something we have to remain focused on. But it can bring in real jobs. And a lot of folks focus on, well, that's just agriculture. Well, maybe a portion of it is. But West Virginia is really not suited to growing a lot of hemp because of our terrain. We can bring it in, we can make products, we can create jobs, and we can put Made in West Virginia on the package. Folks, I thank you for being here this evening. I thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts with you. Have a good evening, and go to the polls November 6th. 6th? Yes. 6th of November. Just to be real crystal clear. Probably most of you in here can't vote for me, but you can talk to your friends and people that live in my district that can. I care about our kids first and their education. I think it's the answer to all our problems. I care about our seniors, because I am one. But I care about uh, uh, veterans, because I, I am one. I, I care about the underprivileged. I'm not one. I've got excellent health care. I don't say that to brag, but I want everybody to have what I have when it comes to health care. I don't want them to have to make a decision between food and heat and, and their health. That's just not acceptable to me. Our education ranks 44th in the country. That's not acceptable to me. So I've been uh, referred to as a straight talker, and I appreciate that. I take that as a compliment. I am a straight talker. I won't feed you a line of baloney. And somebody mentioned transparency earlier. If there's something going on in the legislature and you want to know about it, I'm going to tell you. If you want somebody that's truthful, somebody that's authentic, somebody that's accessible, you want me. During the teacher's stop, uh, strike, the work stoppage, I'm told that some of the senators couldn't be found. I won't run from my problems or my enemies. I'll stand and talk to you. We may disagree, but I'll stand and talk to you. So if you can vote for me, I appreciate it. Take somebody to the polls with you. Your vote doesn't count when you stay home. Thank you very much for having me here. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much, everyone, who took time to join us tonight, either in person or via the interwebs. Uh, we appreciate your time. This is, in fact, what democracy looks like for anyone who's curious. Um, thank you for coming out. A few reminders, Pete, if you want to go to the next slide. There is, if you're feeling all energized by the civic duty and the excitement to vote, there is a fundraiser happening um, right now over at 123 Pleasant Street. Um, you're welcome to hop over there if you're just feeling the, the love and energy of um, doing good things for your community. And then also we have our next slide there that just reminds you a couple of key important dates when it comes to utilizing your voice and your vote. So early voting starts on October 24th, runs through the 3rd of November, and then um, of course election day there on the 6th. Um, some cool things to know, if you don't know this, there, um, there are a bunch of rideshare programs happening right now. If you don't need a ride, that's okay. Maybe share with folks who do. We know um, time and time again that the, one of the uh, number one things that gets in the way of people actually voting is getting to the polls. So let's not make that happen. Um, feel free to jot down that number. If you um, miss that number, feel free to ask someone from the League of Women Voters or Mountaineers for Progress to get you that. Thank you so much and have a great evening. mud bog and work in the fields or just cruising the tire lady has just the right tire for you and if you want your ride to really stand out ask about tire and wheel combinations get the most out of your vehicle with the perfect set of shoes from the tire lady at rainbow tire and the tire lady will take care of you rainbow tire the tire lady takes care of me At the Landing Dental Spa, our goal is to provide quality dental care at a relaxed spa-like atmosphere. Dental chairs with heat and massage, warm neck wraps, and personal TVs make your appointment as stress-free as possible. Located off the Pierpont exit, now accepting new patients of any age. Call 304-594-2200 today and visit our website at www.com thelandingdentalspa.com to schedule an appointment. The Landing Dental Spa, a healthy smile with peace of mind.